Section 22 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Anne of Bohemia, Part 1. The ancestors of the Princess Anne of Bohemia originated from the same country as the Flemish Philippa. She was the nearest relative to that beloved queen, whose hand was attainable, and by means of her uncle, Duke Wenceslas of Brabant, she brought the same popular and profitable commercial alliance to England. Anne of Bohemia was the eldest daughter of the Emperor Charles IV, by his fourth wife, Elizabeth of Pomerania. She was born about 1367 at Prague in Bohemia. The regency who governed England during King Richard II's minority demanded her hand for their young king just before her father died in the year 1380. On the arrival of the English ambassador, Sir Simon Burley, at Prague, the imperial court took measures which seem not a little extraordinary at the present day. England was to Bohemia a sort of terra incognita, and as a general knowledge of geography and statistics was certainly not among the list of imperial accomplishments in the 14th century, the empress dispatched Duke Primislas of Saxony on a voyage of discovery to ascertain, for the satisfaction of herself and the princess, what sort of country England might be. Whatever were the particulars of the duke's discoveries, and his homeward dispatches must have been of a most curious nature. It appears he kept a scrutinizing eye in regard to pecuniary interest. His report seems to have been on the whole satisfactory, since in the Federa we find a letter from the imperial widow of Charles the Fourth, to the effect that I, Elizabeth, Roman Empress, always Augusta, likewise Queen of Bohemia, empowered Duke Primislas to treat with Richard, King of England, concerning the wedlock of that excellent virgin, the damsel Anne, born of us, and in our name to order and dispose, and, as if our own soul were pledged, to swear to the fulfillment of every engagement. When the Duke of Saxony returned to Germany, he carried presents of jewels from the King of England to the ladies who had the care of the princess's education. The Duke of Lancaster, John of Gaunt, would willingly have seen the king his nephew married to his daughter, whom he had by the Lady Blanche of Lancaster. But it was thought that the young lady was too nearly related, being the king's cousin German. Sir Simon Burley, a sage and valiant knight, who had been King Richard's tutor, and had been much beloved by the Prince of Wales, his father, was deputed to go to Germany, respecting the marriage with the emperor's sister. The Duke and Duchess of Brabant, from the love they bore the King of England, received his envoy most courteously, and said it would be a good match for their niece. But the marriage was not immediately concluded, for the damsel was young. Added to this, there shortly happened in England great misery and tribulation, by the calamitous insurrection of Wat Tyler. Richard the Second was the sole surviving offspring of the gallant Black Prince and Joanna of Kent. Born in the luxurious South, the first accents of Richard of Bordeaux were formed in the poetical language of Provence, and his infant tastes linked to music and song, tastes which assimilated ill with the manners of his own court and people. His mother and half-brothers, after the death of his princely father, had brought up the future king of England with the most ruinous personal indulgence, and unconstitutional ideas of his own infallibility. He had inherited more of his mother's levity than his father's strength of character, yet the domestic affections of Richard were of the most vivid and enduring nature, especially towards the females of his family, and the state of distress and terror to which he saw his mother reduced by the insolence of Wat Tyler's mob, was the chief stimulant of his gallant behavior when that rebel fell beneath the sword of Walworth. When these troubles were suppressed, time had obviated the objection to the union of Richard and Anne. The young princess had attained her fifteenth year, and was considered capable of giving a rational consent to her own marriage, 
and after sending a letter to the council of england saying she became the wife of their king with full and free will she set out says froissart on her perilous journey attended by the duke of saxony and his duchess who was her aunt and with a suitable number of knights and damsels they came through brabant to brussels where duke wenislaus and his duchess received the young queen and her company very grandly the lady anne remained with her uncle and aunt more than a month she was afraid of proceeding for she had been informed there were twelve large armed vessels full of normans on the sea between calais and holland that seized and pillaged all that fell in their hands without any respect to persons the report was current that they cruised in those seas awaiting the coming of the king of england's bride because the king of france and his council were very uneasy at richard's german alliance and were desirous of breaking the match detained by these apprehensions the betrothed queen remained at brussels more than a month till the duke of brabant her uncle sent the lords of roussillons and bosqueor to remonstrate with king charles v who was also the near relative of anne upon which king charles remanded the norman cruisers into port but he declared that he granted this favor solely out of love to his cousin anne and out of no regard or consideration for the king of england the duke and duchess were very much pleased and so were all those about to cross the sea the royal bride took leave of her uncle and aunt and departed for brussels duke wenislaus had the princess escorted with one hundred spears she passed through bruges where the earl of flanders received her very magnificently and entertained her for three days she then set out for gravelines where the earl of salisbury waited for her with five hundred spears and as many archers this noble escort conducted her in triumph to calais which belonged to her betrothed lord then the brabant spearmen took their leave after seeing her safely delivered to the english governor the lady anne stayed at calais only till the wind became favorable she embarked on a wednesday morning and the same day arrived at dover where she tarried to repose herself two days the young bride had need of some interval to compose herself after her narrow escape from destruction all our native historians notice the following strange fact which must have originated in a tremendous ground swell scarcely says the chronicler had the bohemian princess set her foot on the shore when a sudden convulsion of the sea took place unaccompanied by wind and unlike any winter storm but the water was so violently shaken and troubled and put in such furious commotion that the ship in which the young queen's person was conveyed was very terribly rent in pieces before her very face and the rest of the vessels that rode in company were tossed so that it astonied all beholders the english parliament was sitting when intelligence came that the king's bride after all the difficulties and dangers of her progress from prague had safely arrived at dover on which it was prorogued but first funds were appointed that with all honor the bride might be presented to the young king on the third day after her arrival the lady anne set forth on her progress to canterbury where she was met by the king's uncle thomas who received her with the utmost reverence and honor when she approached the blackheath the lord mayor and citizens in splendid dresses greeted her and with all the ladies and damsels both from town and country joined her cavalcade making so grand an entry in london that the like had scarcely ever been seen the goldsmith's company seven score of the men of this rich guild splendidly arrayed themselves to meet as they said the caesar's sister nor was their munificence confined to their own persons they further put themselves to the expense of sixty shillings for the hire of seven minstrels with foil on their hats and chaperons and expensive vestures to do honor to the imperial bride and to two shillings further expense for potations for the said minstrels at the upper end of cheap was a pageant of a castle with towers from two sides of which ran fountains of wine from these towers beautiful damsels blew in the faces of the king and queen gold leaf this was thought a device of extreme elegance and ingenuity they likewise threw counterfeit gold florins before the horses feet of the royal party 
Anne of Bohemia was married to Richard II in the chapel royal of the palace of Westminster, the newly erected structure of St. Stephen. On the wedding day, which was the 20th after Christmas, there were, says Froissart, mighty feastings. That gallant and noble knight, Sir Robert Namer, accompanied the queen, from the time when she quitted Prague till she was married. The king at the end of the week carried his queen to Windsor, where he kept open and royal house. They were very happy together. She was accompanied by the king's mother, the Princess of Wales, and her daughter, the Duchess of Bretagne, half-sister to King Richard, who was then in England, soliciting for the restitution of the earldom of Richmond, which had been taken from her husband by the English Regency, and settled in part of dower on Queen Anne. Some days after the marriage of the royal pair, they returned to London, and the coronation of the queen was performed most magnificently. At the young queen's earnest request, a general pardon was granted by the king, at her consecration. The afflicted people stood in need of this respite, as the executions, since Tyler's insurrection, had been bloody and barbarous beyond all precedent. The land was reeking with the blood of the unhappy peasantry, when the humane intercession of the gentle Anne of Bohemia put a stop to the executions. This mediation obtained for Richard's bride the title of the good Queen Anne, and years, instead of impairing the popularity, usually so evanescent in England, only increased the esteem felt by her subjects for this beneficent princess. Grand tournaments were held directly after the coronation. Many days were spent in these solemnities, wherein the German nobles, who had accompanied the queen to England, displayed their chivalry to the great delight of the English. Our chroniclers call Anna Bohemia the beauteous queen. At fifteen or sixteen, a blooming German girl is a very pleasing object, but her beauty must have been limited to stature and complexion, for the features of her statue are homely and undignified. A narrow, high-pointed forehead, a long upper lip, cheeks, whose fullness increased towards the lower part of the face, can scarcely entitle her to claim a reputation for beauty. But the headdress she wore must have neutralized the defects of her face in some degree, by giving an appearance of breath to her narrow forehead. This was the horn cap which constituted the headgear of the ladies of Bohemia and Hungary, and in this moony tire did the bride of Richard present herself to the astonished eyes of her female subjects. Queen Anne made some atonement for being the importer of these hideous fashions, by introducing the use of pins, such as are used at our present toilets. Our chroniclers declare that, previously to her arrival in England, the English fair fastened their robes with skewers, a great misrepresentation, for, even as early as the Roman Empire, the use of pins was known, and English barrows have been opened, wherein were found numbers of very neat and efficient little ivory pins, which had been used in arranging the grave clothes of the dead. And can these irreverent chroniclers suppose that English ladies use worse fastenings for their robes in the 14th century? Side saddles were the third new fashion, brought into England by Anne of Bohemia. They were different from those used at present, which were invented, or first adopted, by Catherine de' Medici, Queen of France. The side saddle of Anne of Bohemia was like a bench with a hanging step, where both feet were placed. This mode of riding required a footman or squire at the bridal reign of the lady's palfrey, and was chiefly used in processions. According to the fashion of the age, the young queen had a device, which all her knights were expected to wear at tournaments. But her device was, we think, a very stupid one, being an ostrich, with a bit of iron in his mouth. In the celebration of the festival of the Order of the Garter, 1384, Queen Anne wore a robe of violet cloth, dyed in grain, the hood lined with scarlet, the robe lined with fur. She was attended by a number of noble ladies, who were mentioned as, newly received into the society of the Garter. They were habited in the same costume as their young queen. The royal spouse of Anne was remarkable for the foppery of his dress. He had one coat estimated at 30,000 marks. Its chief value must have arisen from the precious stones with which it was adorned. This was called apparel, broidered of stone. 
Notwithstanding the great ascension of luxury that followed this marriage, the daughter of the Caesars, as Richard proudly called his bride, not only came portionless to the English throne matrimonial, but her husband had to pay a very handsome sum for the honor of calling her his own. He paid to her brother ten thousand marks for the imperial alliance, besides being at the whole charge of her journey. The jewels of the Duchy of Aquitaine, the floriated coronet, and many brooches in the forms of animals, were pawned to the Londoners, in order to raise money for the expenses of the bridal. To Anne of Bohemia is attributed the honor of being the first, in that illustrious band of princesses, who were the nursing mothers of the Reformation. The Protestant Church inscribes her name at the commencement of the illustrious list, in which are seen those of Anne Boleyn, Catherine Parr, Lady Jane Grey, and Queen Elizabeth. Whether the young queen brought those principles with her, or imbibed them from her mother-in-law, the Princess of Wales, it is not easy to ascertain. A passage quoted by Huss, the Bohemian reformer, leads to the inference that Anne was used to read the scriptures in her native tongue. It is possible, says Wycliffe, in his work called The Threefold Bond of Love, that our noble queen of England, sister of the Caesar, may have the gospel written in three languages, Bohemian, German, and Latin. Now, to hereticate her, brand her with heresy, on that account, would be Luciferian folly. The influence of Queen Anne over the mind of her young husband was certainly employed by Joanna, Princess of Wales, to aid her in saving the life of Wycliffe, when in great danger at the Council of Lambeth in 1382. Joanna, Princess of Wales, was a convert of Wycliffe, who had been introduced to her by his patron, the Duke of Lancaster. Joanna, aided by her daughter-in-law, swayed the ductile mind of King Richard to their wishes. Soon after, the queen was separated from her husband by a war in Scotland. The most remarkable incident of his campaign was the murder of Lord Stafford by the king's half-brother, John Holland. Jealousy of the queen's favor and malice against her adherents appear to be the secret motives of this deed. Stafford was a peerless chevalier, adored by the English army, and, for his virtuous conduct, in high favor with Anne of Bohemia, who called him her knight. And he was actually on his way to London, with messages from the king to the queen, when this fatal encounter took place. The ostensible cause of the murder likewise was connected with the queen, as we learn from Froissart that archers of Lord Stafford, when protecting Sir Mellus, a Bohemian knight then with the army, who was a friend of Queen Anne, slew a favorite squire belonging to Sir John Holland. And to revenge a punishment which this man had brought upon himself, Sir John cut Lord Stafford down without any personal provocation. The grief of the Earl of Stafford, his entreaties for justice on the murderer of his son, and, above all, the atrocious circumstances of the case, wrought on King Richard to vow that an exemplary act of justice should be performed on John Holland, brother though he might be, as soon as he ventured from the shrine of St. John of Beverly, whither this homicide had fled for sanctuary. In vain Joanna, Princess of Wales, the mutual mother of the king and murderer, pleaded with Richard, after his return from Scotland, that the life of Sir John might be spared. After four days' incessant lamentation, the king's mother died on the fifth day, at the royal castle of Wallingford. Richard's resolution failed him at this catastrophe, and, when too late to save his mother, he pardoned the criminal. The aggrieved persons, in this unhappy adventure, were the friends of the queen, but there is no evidence that she excited her husband's wrath. The homicide who had occasioned so much trouble departed, on an atoning pilgrimage to Syria. He was absent from England during the life of Queen Anne, and happy would it have been for his brother if he had never returned. Anne of Bohemia, unlike Isabella of France, who was always at war with her husband's favorites and friends, made it a rule of life to love all that the king loved, and to consider a sedulous compliance with his will as her first duty. In one instance alone did this pliancy of temper lead her into the violation of justice. This was the case of the reputation of the Countess of Oxford. 
There were great murmurings against the Duke of Ireland, says Froissart, but what injured him most was his conduct to his duchess, the Lady Philippa, daughter of the Lord de Courcy, a handsome and noble lady. For the Duke was greatly enamoured with one of the Queen's damsels, called the Landgraven. She was a tolerably handsome, pleasant woman, whom Queen Anne had brought with her from Bohemia. The Duke of Ireland loved her with such ardour, that he was desirous of making her, if possible, his duchess by marriage. All the good people of England were much shocked at this, for his lawful wife was granddaughter to the gallant King Edward and the excellent Queen Philippa, being the daughter of the Princess Isabella. Her uncles, the Dukes of Gloucester and York, were very wroth at this insult. The first and last error of Anne of Bohemia was the participation in this disgraceful transaction, by which she was degraded in the eyes of subjects who had warmly admired her meek virtues. The offensive part taken by the queen in this transaction was that she actually wrote with her own hand an urgent letter to Pope Urban, persuading him to sanction the divorce of the Countess of Oxford, and to authorize the marriage of her faithless lord with the Landgraven. Whether the maid of honor were a princess or a peasant, she had no right to appropriate another man's husband. The queen was scarcely less culpable in aiding and abetting so nefarious a measure, to the infinite injury of herself, and of the consort she so tenderly loved. There was scarcely an earl in England who was not related to the royal family. The queen, by the part she took in this disgraceful affair, offended every one allied to the royal house of Plantagenet. The storm fell in its fury on the head of the unfortunate Sir Simon Burley, the same knight whom we have seen make two journeys to Prague, in solemn embassy, regarding the queen's marriage. This unfortunate knight, who was the most accomplished man of his age, had been foredoomed by his persecutors. The Earl of Arundel had previously expressed an opinion to King Richard, that Sir Simon de Burley deserved death. Didst thou not say to me in the time of thy Parliament, when we were in the bath behind the White Hall, that Sir Simon de Burley deserved to be put to death on several accounts? And did not I make answer, I know no reason why he should suffer death? And yet you and your companions traitorously took his life from him. Such was the accusation by King Richard, when Arundel stood on his trial, to pay the bitter debt of vengeance that Richard had noted against him, as the cause of his tutor's death. The death of Sir Simon Burley was a bitter sorrow to the queen, perhaps her first sorrow, and as it appears that the expenses of her journey from Germany, being left unpaid by the government, during the king's minority, ultimately led to the disgrace of her friend, the queen must have considered herself as the innocent cause of his death. While the executions of Sir Simon Burley and many others of the king's adherents were proceeding in London, Richard and his queen retired to Bristol, and fixed their residence in the castle. End of section 22